Thank you, Sheila. Um, all right, so this is, so what I'm gonna talk about is work we've done for a while on prob relational probabilistic models. I'm not going to give a survey. There's lots of people who've given surveys. I'm gonna try and explain some things that are sort of, most people in the field know, except a lot of people don't know. Um, and that's sort of useful that other people should know that you get beyond just reading the research papers. That's my goal here. All right, so I started off with this um, quote from Steven Pinker and the part that this talks about is about probabilistic reasoning about entities, about things. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. And of course, if, according to this quote, that's what the mind is about. All right, so I'm gonna talk about what are relational probabilistic models and relational learning. I'm trying to explain what they are, both as relational models and knowledge graphs. I'm gonna talk about recent work in learning knowledge graphs and what is actually learned and how it works. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how to learn general knowledge. So lifted graphical models. And we're gonna talk about, briefly talk about um, how if you wanna be Bayesian and you wanna treat probability as a function of your knowledge, then you should do lifted inference. And if, finally, we'll talk about identity and existence uncertainty, which are sort of core topics, but are well under-researched. So a lot of this I'm going to try to emphasize what hasn't been done as well. All right. So the motivation of this is AI studies what agents should do. And agents act in the world and acting is gambling. And there's theorems that basically says that agents who don't use probability will lose to those who do. So if you you're acting in the, if you're gambling in the world, if you're acting in the world, you're gambling. If you're gambling, you should use probability. And no prediction is certain. Anyone who believes, never believe anyone who gives you definitive predictions. If someone tells you, you will be run over tomorrow, do not believe them. If someone tells you, you will not be run over tomorrow, do not believe them. Do not act on the advice because both of them are dangerous and silly to believe. Instead, you want someone to predict the probability of something from which you can use the utility to make decisions. The other part of this is the world can be modeled in terms of entities with properties and relations. Lots of people in this community know this. If you look at most of the probabilistic reasoning in machine learning, they talk about features and random variables. And part of this is that features or random variables need to have internal structure. So there's, that's the other part of this. We want to reason about objects, relationships, and make decisions. It seems pretty obvious to me. Um, okay. So here's a way of thinking about it as we start off from propositional logic, if you start off from propositional logic, you can get to probability by adding measures over possible worlds. You can get to propositional logic, you can add relations, logical variables and quantification, you get to predicate logic. And of course, we want to do both and they're what's called relational probabilistic models. That's what we're interested in here. So we're going to have both measures over possible worlds and relations and logical variables. I'm not really going to do the semantics here. Um, I'm just going to give you, tell you the overall features of what's happening here. All right, so let's now think about what are these things. So there's this world on relational learning and statistical relational AI, and it sort of seems funny to a lot of people because when you start with a, an introduction to AI or an introduction to machine learning, you typically start with learning from relations. So there's a relation, number of examples, and there's an action of skips and reads. You've got to work out a function of whether the user is going to skip and read when they're reading a news article, depending on the author and the thread and the length, and you build a decision tree or a neural network or something. However, most relations in the world are not like this. Most relations in the world contain links to other relations. So it actually contains, and what, so what makes relational models special is that the values are meaningless names. So for example, the student number, the product ID, the user ID, the movie ID. So here's an example from the movie Lens 100K, there's a user 196 who's rated movie 242 with a rating was three and here's the time. Only the rating and the timestamp have any meaning. So as far as the user is concerned, you can exchange them or swap them around. It has exactly the same meaning. So there's a notion of exchangeability in here that's important is that they're just meaningless names. And whenever you have a student number, whenever you have a product ID or anything else, they're just meaningless names. There's nothing, they're not an ordinal or a cardinal or anything else. They're just meaningless names. And so that's what we're going to think about how to handle that. So it gives you uh, opportunities to real databases um, and it also gives you things to exploit. The exchangeability is something we're going to exploit. All right, so this is something that most people in this community probably know, but I'll do it anyway. Um, so lots of ways of representing facts. So pen seven is red, you could write down as red pen seven. The trouble with that is you can't query 
you know, in first order logic, you can't say, what is the color of pen seven? You can't query that. It's sort of in prolog, for example. You could do color pen seven red, and all of a sudden you can do both things. You can query, let's say, what's the color, you know, what is red and what is the color of pen seven? And that seems like a good trick. We should do it again. So we do it again. So, we reify, so we're going to reify color. We get prop pen seven color red. We find out we don't even need to do it again. Yes, we can stop here. There's no need to do it again. We know because you can end up with just a single relation. And so this is what's called triples. A single relation can be implicit and you end up with triples. Um, here's this pen color seven red. So there's just gonna drop the relation and just have triples. So all relations can be represented in terms of triples. Um, there's the relation of the predicate and the, VR, the values. Um, and this can be represented as a triple of Ri has a property Pj has value Vij. Now Ri is either a primary key or it's a reified entity. A reified entity is something we make, something like a booking. So you have a booking that has properties. So it could be just seen as a relation. As far as we're concerned, it's a reified entity. And the reified entity is going to play a part in this story because they turn out to be things that the machine learning people can't handle. Um, so reified endings like a booking, a marriage, a talk, a lab report, and so on. So there's all sorts of reified entities that can appear. That appear. All right. And it's the only relation we need. So it calls it semantic networks and entity relationship models. And more recently, it's just been called knowledge graphs. There's nothing special. It's just the old fashioned things we were all familiar with. However, what we're going to do now is we're going to start learning them. All right. Now, lots of that's sort of frustrating working in this area because lots of them knowledge graphs can do things really, really naive ways they, they do it. So projecting into pairs, for example, is common. They lose information. So for example, Air Canada flies from New York to Vancouver. When Air Canada flies from Vancouver to Los Angeles, you could convert it to triples. And these are two triples that Air Canada flies from New York and Air Canada flies to Los Angeles. However, Air Canada doesn't fly from New York to Los Angeles. You're losing this information. And it turns out that nearly all the people who build knowledge graphs from more complex relations don't do that. So here's an example from FB15K, a, um, a variant of free base that, a knowledge base that's probably the most commonly used in research papers. And it has things like Jade North um, has plays position defender and Jade North, of course, is a, um, a soccer player from, from the Socceroos, the Australian national team. Um, and this is one of the test cases in FB15K. And I, it actually has the name, it actually has just a meaningless symbol in here. And I mapped it into Jade North because I did, we did this form. Um, and Real Zaragoza is a um, football club that has position defender. And this is again, one of the problems. And what happens in this is we try to predict one of the tuples given the other two. And as you can imagine, you know, some of these are easy and some of these are almost impossible to do. Um, so it's important when you look at these things to please, if you ever start doing this, please read these knowledge graphs, look at them, see what they say. Um, the first rule of machine learning should be look at the data and it's sort of shocking how many people don't. Okay. The other thing is that when we get a lot of people who do sort of machine learning things, they sort of think about, oh, they're like, just like words. And words, you can represent them as vectors and we're gonna represent entities as vectors soon. And you end up with king minus man plus woman is queen. So the difference between man and woman is the same as the difference between king and queen. And so what you do is you end up tempting to want to do this. And there's so many models called translational models that say, well, Brussels is just Belgium plus the capital of, and Washington DC is USA plus the capital of. And you can think of these just as vectors. But unfortunately, this entails that USA is Belgium minus Brussels plus Washington DC. Um, and I guarantee that if I tell you everything about Belgium and everything about Brussels and everything about Washington DC, you will not be able to tell me anything interesting about the USA. Um, so it's also good to think about what your models mean because sometimes they end up think, doing things that don't mean very much. All right. Um, so the message here is words can have simple meanings, but almost all entities are multifaceted and complex. So entities are much more complicated than, than words. All right, so let's talk about how to learn knowledge graphs. Before that, I want to give a piece of background that everyone should know, but when I talk to people, hardly any people do, the relationship between conditional probabilities and, and sigmoids and logistic regression. 
So this is the probability of H given the evidence, the probability of H and the evidence divided by the probability of the evidence. And the obvious thing to do is there's a common term, so you should divide it out and you get one over one plus the probability of not H given E. And I'm gonna do a weird trick. I'm going to just put E to the log. So I'm gonna put E to the log. So I'm gonna do one plus E to the minus log. And I'm gonna flip that. <clears throat> I'm gonna flip that. And what that ends up doing is that's the sigmoid, which is one over one plus E to the minus X of the log odds. And then what happens is we end up trying to model things, the odds as a product, and that gives a sigmoid of a sum and that gives us logistic regression. And the other thing that is interesting is that when you have even neural networks, if you have, if you want to do the, if you want to learn the end point, the very end feature, once you have all the features you've learned, and if you want a Boolean feature, you take a sigmoid because of this relationship. So it's trying to do independent features. If you have discrete features, the discrete version of this is softmax. And this learn, learns a probability. All right, so, so this is going to appeal in what we're doing. All right, so let's think about how to learn this. So if you want to learn a, a relation like likes person movie, so the movie lens, um, in the, so in the movie lens example I gave before, and the Netflix prize, the one that they said to do was basically this. Um, so the sigmoid here is because I'm learning a Boolean. So if you're learning a real valued number, you'd just leave out the sigmoid. And you end up with this, there's a, for every entity, um, for every person P, there's a, there's a vat, there's a, for integers, there's going to be a value of E0 of P of S, and there's an E1 for each movie. So there's a, these could be seen as matrices. And this is called matrix factorization because this sum inside it is, you know, is just corresponds to matrix multiplication. So there's an embedding, there's a value of feature vectors for each person, for each movie. Um, all right, so to learn a triple, um, the obvious way to do it, if you ask me, is just to add three things in here. Um, the probability of E0 of FH and E1 of F and R and E2 of F and T. Um, and you're just multiplying three things before you sum out one. Um, lots of people find this strange because they're so embedded in matrices that they, that this doesn't look like a matrix multiplication. Indeed, it's not. It's something called the polyadic decomposition. It was invented around 1927, the paper that is often referred to, and that there are two, in this model here, for triples, there are two vector embeddings for each entity and one for each relation. Now, unfortunately, the polyadic decomposition doesn't work very well. So let's look at these two examples of P123 likes movie M53, and M53 is directed by P534. The trouble with this is these are separate embeddings. So the embedding for, in this for M53 in this position is just completely unrelated to this in this position. So it can never find out that people, this person likes movies directed by something. It's not something that can be represented. Um, oh, by the way, this requires, right, the tail embeddings do not interact. The, the head and the tail embeddings do not interact. So there's a whole lot of solutions to this. One is distmult, where you share the same embeddings for the head and the tail. The problem with this is you can only represent symmetric relations. Um, complex is like this mult, but the embeddings are complex numbers and the tail is the conjugate of the head embedding. So we end up with, um, with something else that, um, that's sort of a bit more, that's complex. Um, it's pretty hard to explain what's going on. Simple is one we invented that says you're basically doing have an embedding for r to the minus one and you learn to predict both HR of T and T R to the minus one of H. So you're learning both ways around. And this lets these now interact because they now share. So now both the head and the tail now participate in both embeddings. What I, my fav current favorite one is one we'll call simple plus. It's simple, but with non-negative entity embeddings. So we're just assuming that all of the embeddings for entities are not negative. So we don't allow that. So this can represent arbitrary relations. It's what's called fully expressive. You have to be careful when you hear the term fully expressive because it means you can memorize anything. It doesn't mean it can, it can generalize well, but if it can't, it's not fully expressive and has all this implicit biases like for distmult where it can't represent symmetric relations. The other reason is that point wise, um, <clears throat> that the less than or equal to for the embeddings for relations corresponds to implication in simple. So you can do sim simple plus, you can do simple forms of implication by in terms of the embeddings. But the other reason I like it most is that we can actually explain what it is that it learns. So 
So if it's easy to explain, well, it's possible to explain what's actually being learned in here. And that's what I want to talk about now. So here's this one that's what I call PD plus for the polyadic decomposition. <clears throat> but only with non-negative embeddings for the head and the tail. I can assume that all the embedding values are bounded. So if you think about this, what happens in this sum is that everything that's, the things that are interesting are these ones that are not zero. So the ones that are approximately zero sort of become irrelevant. So the ones we want to think about are the values that we're summing that are far away from zero. So this, this product is approximately zero if any of them are approximately zero. So what we want to look at is the ones where the features are all away from zero. So this product is bigger than zero if all of them are bigger than, much bigger than zero. So, and so now what happens is, so now we're looking at those ones. Now let's just consider those ones. Now it turns out that feature I forms a soft clustering of entities. So this feature, this particular feature, um, a particular feature I, so there's all of those entities for which E zero of E of I is high and that becomes a real, uh, an, an soft embedding, a soft clustering. So there's for every threshold, for example, there's a clustering, but there's a soft clustering here. And then there's those E's for which E two of E I is high. And there's another clustering. And what happens is that the entities in the first cluster related to the entities in the second cluster for any relation for which E one of I is high. So we have these two clusterings, one above, one clustering for the head and one clustering for the tail. And, and what happens is that each position, there's a clustering for each position in this, in this um, embedding. And the relations sort of pick out which clusterings they want to do. And so that's what's happening in here. Um, and the negative values for e of R, v, v1, the one of relation, provide exceptions to the rule. So you can have these high values and then you can add exceptions for subclasses where there are subclasses. So you could do, all right. Um, okay, so now let's think about what we're gonna do. Suppose there's an issue now about learning general knowledge by learning specifically about the data sets. Suppose you wanna create a model of who's friends with whom. So two obvious solutions, one of which is you could learn general knowledge. So you get transitivity, how males and female friendship works, how locations affect friendship. We could try to learn general knowledge we could learn specific knowledge. We could learn here clusters of people, which particular group of people are generally friends with each other, or which group of people are friends with other people. Maybe it's not symmetric. And so you're just clustering the people. So if you try this, you'll find that the specific knowledge will be more accurate on the population, but doesn't generalize to different populations. So if you're Facebook, you should probably try to learn specific knowledge because you sort of, you know everyone. You don't need to learn um, specific rule, general rules about it. And if, and what happens is that the arguably the general knowledge will tend to transfer better to different, to different domains. Um, so which is better depends on the goals and how success is measured. So depending on how we're actually measuring success, we're going to get very different things. It turns out that the learning specific knowledge, if you're just learning on the same database, on the same knowledge base graph, always wins, basically always wins. There's no point in learning general knowledge. It's much better just to learn specific knowledge. However, if you want to do more than just do better on the current data set, then you might want to learn general knowledge. And the previous models that we talked about learned the specific knowledge. They didn't learn any general knowledge. So ideally, we'd like to do both. We'd like to learn about specific entities and general knowledge. And it turns out there's not so many people who are, who are doing this. There's very few models that are doing this. Now let's think about evaluating these predictions. So when we're evaluating the predictions, were there only positive examples provided? And this is what's a big challenge, what we're doing. We consider, so think about the following relations, married to, where everyone's married to either zero or one people, friends of, or you might be friends of, you know, tens to hundreds of people. We knows about, it's very asymmetric. So there's some people who are known about by millions or billions of people. And so maybe it gets, would get along with as a relation, which is maybe nearly everyone can get along with each other. So we don't, given these knowledge bases, we don't know what sort of relation this is. We just have these positive things to try to predict other ones. Um, what happens in here is that we try and, so the game that people play is, so given that most knowledge bars contain, graphs only contain positive information, then we want to evaluate predictions. So you want to say who is, who plays position defender and which, who, Jade North plays which position. There's a sort of queries that we're answering. And people do 
ranking, such as so-called mean reciprocal rank or hit at one or hit at 10. We hit at 10 says you get to have 10 guesses and you've got to try and what's the percentage of times you get the right answer in your top 10 guesses. And, if you, and the problem, there's a few problems with this of just ranking. Um, number one, it's not good for answers for which there's no answer or many answers. Who is the Pope married to is an example of a query for which there's, you know, the answer is no one. But in this never actually appears, you never actually get this question because it's never a test case. So it's never a test case when you have the answer is no one. And the problem too is an oracle that knows everyone does actually very poor. So if you have an oracle that knows about everyone about, everyone about positions and, and everything in that football, then you know, it could answer question Jade North plays position, which position. If you ask who plays position defender and you're basically saying, try and guess which position, which player out of all the defenders um, we're going to do. And I'm sure Jade North comes very low in any positions in there. Um, Real Zaragoza has position something or other, you know, is the question. And, you know, there's lots of positions, but there's, every team has a position defender. And so we end up with having a, a problem in here. So another challenge is to design a good evaluation scheme. So log likelihood seems reasonable, but require a knowledge of negations. We need to know what's false in order to evaluate them. And because we only have true facts, it's hard to evaluate. All right. So tense. So now, so tensor factorization models work well for predicting relations, but not for predicting properties. So if you want to predict the property of something, it doesn't work very well. And the reason is because tensor factorization relies on a lower dimensional representation. There isn't one for properties. So it actually turns out that you can't do the tensorization for predicting properties. So imagine you try to predict both the age of a person and the rating simultaneously of the person P on movie M. And if you try to embed them, you basically can just, there's enough parameters so you can just memorize the age. So you can just memorize the age. One of the embeddings for each person can just remember the age and you end up with no generalization. There are too many parameters. So what we need to do is to predict the age using properties of the movies and the ratings. Um, and this one here requires what we call aggregation. So you're trying to work out, given a person, here's a set of all of the movies that they've rated. Let's try and move it. Let's try and predict it from that. So this, so some of the models provide implicit aggregation and some you can use whatever, they say you can use whatever aggregation we want. However, we don't know what we want. Um, we need some ways to do better models of aggregation, I think. All right. So if we look at beyond triples, if we have relations with multiple arguments, we could convert them to triples by reifying. Um, but unfortunately this doesn't work very well because the reified entities have very few data points and the number of data points for reified entities, the number of arguments of the original relations. So you could convert them to, triple, to triples, but reifying doesn't actually mix well with these models. Um, you, could you could design an embedding based model that works directly with, with original relations. And you could also allow them to be inferred from other relations, for example, in the projection um, of another relation or the join of other relations. So you could actually try to do that. Um, view that when you have more complicated relations. All right, so I'm just going to quickly do a, a few other things that are useful. Um, so there's a whole lot of other work that's done. So here's an example of this. You want to predict, predict the relation. You have S3 and S4. You want to predict them on course C, C4. S3 and S4 have a B average. You know, they both have Bs. And you have, the question is what student would you do better? Um, pause the video sometime and have a look at the example. And you can do this as a, as a graphical model. The grade of a student two in course one depends on the intelligence of student two and the difficulty of course one. And we can share all, build a base net like this and share the parameters. So, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so what we can do is we can build a model here, the grade of the student on the course, as a function, as this other A, B, and C. And we're going to share this between all students and all courses. And then it's called parameter sharing. And we can do that and we can end up with just putting in our, in our normal tool based net tools. What we're going to do is we're going to do something a bit more interesting than, than that. Well, so here's the example. So we're going to have this plate notation I'm going to draw S and C. There's going to be a, an intelligence of, of S for every student S, there's going to be intelligence for every course. C, there's going to be a difficulty, of course, and for every student course pair, there's going to be a, 
is going to be a, um, a grade of it. So we'll skip it. All right. And if there are a thousand hunt students and a hundred courses, it turns out there are a lot of random variables. It's an enormous Bayes net. So there are in the, here, there are 100, there are 101,100 different random variables, but there's only 10 parameters to learn in here. All right. So what we're going to do is, so now there's a whole lot of models that are sort of based on this idea. And we're going to ask how do they aggregate? And the common aggregations are weighted formulae. So Markov logic networks, an undirected model that use weighted formulae. And there are, and there's a directed version of this is called relational logistic regression. Um, and you can do a whole lot of other ways of doing it. You can do aggregation by existential, like in logic programs where the head, the, there's an implicit ex exists for variables in the body, not in the head. And then you end up with sort of independent choice logic or problog. Um, and the interesting thing is MLN and RLR are identical and everything else is observed. So we can think about here how to actually do directed versus undirected models in here. Um, I should also mention one of my other favorites is the relational dependency networks and mo directed models that induce a Markov chain. And I think that's going to be maybe the, the answer to a lot of the problems that we're going to get. I just want to give one example of this. If we have an example like this, you can look at it later on when we see it, the probability of Q given observations turns out to be a sigmoid of a polynomial. That's the only thing I want you to get out of this slide. We end up with the probability of Q when things are a sigmoid of a polynomial. And it turns out that, that sigmoids of polynomials are really hard to learn. Don't extrapolate, it's really hard to extrapolate from a polynomial. The polynomial is really poor at extrapolating from. So here are two graphs, the two sigmoids, two polynomials, um, but both they agree between zero and 60, but one of them, because it's a you know, sigmoid of zero n squared, if it goes down, it has to come up. There's a positive term in here. And the other one is, so it's convex. So if it goes down, it has to come up. Um, and so it has to come up sometimes. So if you don't know what your model means, then you're going to get into trouble. Okay. So, so what we're going to do is exchangeability. So before we know anything about entities, they are indistinguishable and so should be treated identically. That's sort of a basic, basic tenant of these um, of probability. So to the, uh, these relational models. So the exchangeability, the names can be exchanged and the models doesn't care. So the model doesn't depend on the naming of things. And so if you're a Bayesian, the probability depends on what's known and that's conditioning. So you condition on your knowledge. However, entities about which you have the same information, you should have the same probability because we have exactly the same information about them. We know exactly the same things about them. And that provides a symmetry that we can exploit in lifted inference. The game of lifted inference is to do probabilistic reasoning. We're also exploiting the symmetry um, between, so exploiting both the relational structure um, in terms of the symmetry, plus also the graph, the independent structure that's provided by um, the, um, the underlying graphical model. And so this, I'm not going to talk about this. I'd recommend that you watch Guy Vandenbroek's Computers and Thought lecture from Ijkai last year, which has a, which is nice and talks about a very different viewpoint from this talk. Um, so lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about, briefly talk about identity and existence uncertainty. So lifted inference requires counting and counting require, well, let's look at this example. Suppose in the room was Sam's mother and Chris's football coach and a brilliant mathematician and how many people were in the room? Well, if you think about it, you'll find out that there's at least one person in the room. That's the only thing you can say. So if you also specify there's no one else, then it's between one and three people in the room. So another thing we need really need to do to make these things work is we need knowledge graphs to be able to stay and there are no more. Um, I think getting the, um, the knowledge graph to state that, getting people to use it, I think would be much harder. But somehow that would solve a whole lot of the problems that we need here. Just a very simple statements. We don't want the you know, a universal assumption like the closed world assumption. We just want to be able to people to say that, oh, there are no more of these. We know that. That's a piece of knowledge fact that we can condition on and it's actually very useful knowledge. All right. So to prize here the, ident the notion of identity. So we have to worry about here whether these things are the same or different things. So it requires, counting requires knowledge of identity. And you end up with this correspondence problem as there are symbols 
and there are entities and each symbol has a description and he has to refer to this entity. And maybe it can refer to no one. There are no houses with pink roofs. And there's, if there are C, J symbols and I entities, there are C to the I plus one correspondences and the probability distribution over that gets pretty hairy. Um, and so there are very few ways of solving that. But if you're, if you're unsure about identity, you need to solve that. So that's still reasonably an open problem. Um, although there are some reasonably good solutions that I can tell you about sometimes you ask me. Um, one of the things we want if we're doing probability is to have probability over well-defined propositions. And it makes no sense to say house H4 and roof color H4 pink and not exists H4, which is sort of what we're doing. So we're saying, well, it's, is there something, because exists is not a predicate. So what we'd like to do is, and the other challenge is what if more than one entity exists, which one are you referring to? In a house with three bedrooms, you might have a model that talks about the second bedroom, but houses don't come labeled with first bedrooms and second bedrooms, um, the same way your model might. Um, I'll see this one, I'm running out of time. So one of the things you could do is we could, when we make observations, you're going to basically split this world up. So if you observe, so here's an example, if you observe a blip, yes, you'll hang on, I won't come. If we observe a, um, a blip, you know, there may be there's a plane or there's not a plane. When we observe another blip, you've got to have the hypothesis when there's a plane before that's the same plane or another plane, or maybe this is a false alarm. And one of the things that I, that we, I worked on a while ago, which I think is a nice idea that hasn't really been followed up, is what I would like to do is to build a, a semantic tree. Where we're going to split on well-defined propositions. So we have a true part here, there exists an X, X where there exists a thing which is either true or false. And we're going to build a, a logical generative model which defines this first order tree which talks about existences. And we can have interesting hypothesis trees, decision trees with probabilities over them for, um, that talk about the existence of things. And in, notice in here that you can use the term A, when the existing apartment is true, we can use the term A in this term. So we can say, is there a bedroom in this A? In this one, we can have well-defined prop, prop. We can have probabilities over this because they're well-defined propositions. Okay. Um, so in conclusion, so there are challenge. So the challenge is to model and learn uncertainty about properties of entities. So we'll learn about properties. We'll learn about relationships. We'll learn about how properties and relations interact. We'll learn about identity of entities, existence of number of identities. Um, and all their interactions with time, ontologies, and causality. Um, and there's still lots of things to do in here. And I thought I'd end up with a quote from um, Bertrand Russell 100 years ago. And so what the, you know, what's required is, a, is the allow full importance of relations. And so we want to build on here and build the importance of relations. And this was last century. So if you want to move into last century, you should relations. If you want to use this century, you should use probabilities. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you.